Hi, welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. So, uh, in the last four videos, we've taken a little bit of departure from the material directly from the Rollo May book. And in this video, we're going to reconnect with the Rollo May book. Like I told you earlier, the strategy behind that is to give you a little extra time to catch up on your reading assignment, basically. So, uh, in the last two videos, uh, we talked quite a bit about uh, hermeneutics and the relationship between hermeneutics and Eastern meditative practice, especially in a Buddhist vein. In the two videos before that, we talked quite a bit about Soren Kierkegaard and especially his sort of three-stage developmental scheme, three modes of existence basically, and also about his concept of dread, which I thought would be uh, the areas of his thought most relevant to the project of psychology and of interest to students of psychology like yourselves. So, uh, in this video, like I said, we're going to reconnect with the Rollo May book. Hopefully, uh, you've caught up on your reading assignment because we're going to be uh, tracing through uh, some issues in the latter half of your first reading assignment. And they're going to have to do with how existentialists conceive of being and more specifically with the truth of being. But before we get into that, let's get the crazy professor hair which is exacerbated by the COVID crisis and the lack of <laughs> barbers under control, under control, hair under control. All right. So uh, can you see me? You can still see me. Okay. So uh, now back to Rollo May. Okay. So psychology, most of the time, is interested in human beings. Yeah, every now and then you'll find some psychologist who's specifically interested in things like uh, animal behavior or animal cognition or something like that. But 99% of the time, psychologists are interested in human beings. But when you think about it, what really is a human being? Okay, so is it just a, a mammalian biped walking around with a you know, supposedly well-developed cerebral cortices. <laughs> well, I guess that'd be one point of view, but a different point of view might go something like this. Well, a human being is actually a kind of being because it's sort of in the name, a human being. So in a way, uh, the whole question of ontology is woven into the primary topic matter of psychology. So at some point, it behooves us to ask the question, okay, well, you know, if a human being is a kind of being, then what is being about? Well, here's the thing about that. Uh, asking what it is to be is one of those weird kinds of questions where you thought you had the answer to it before someone asked the question, at least in some sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, difficult, incisive way. All right. So we all think we understand what it is to be. But uh, when someone begins to ask us, it can be sort of an embarrassment to find out that we don't really have a very good idea about it. All right. So um, it's a difficult ontological question. So characteristics of being for existentialists. Now, here's the deal about this next little mass of material. Some of these things you will have heard about before in previous videos. And so when we arrive at those, I'll be sort of moving through them relatively quickly just to remind you of what the ideas are about. Other elements of this are going to be new to you. So I'll start to slow down when we reach those. So the first one should be very familiar to you because it came right out of your, I think the very first getting started video, how existentialists conceive of existence. And here, uh, remember that I gave you a couple ways of thinking about that in terms of holism for one and a, and a particular example of holism within the larger canon of existential thinking would be this idea of Dasein. This comes to us by way of Martin Heidegger, one of these interesting philosophers, or being in the world would be sort of an English translation of Dasein. In German, Dasein means to be there. Sein in German means it's the infinitive form uh, of to be, and da means there. So to be there, uh, by which we mean a mutual, ongoing, reciprocal interplay between the subjective experiential side of life and the objective uh, sort of concrete side of life. Or, uh, to put it another way, uh, a mutual reciprocal relationship between what we are and what the world is. That the two are always mutually influencing one another. So much so that really if you're going to characterize being in any sort of uh, holistic way, you'd have to say that really uh, the subjective side of life and the objective side of life are just 
two views of the very same unitary phenomenon. <laughs> okay, so that's a way of reminding you more than teaching you for the first time. Okay, so the next idea might be a little bit more of new stuff for you. Because we are beings in the world, I'm going to slow down, start slowing down. Because we are beings in the world. Yeah, not that slow. Okay, don't be a douchebag. All right, so because we're beings in the world, uh, the truth of our being, the truth of existence, the truth of our humanity is always a matter of the perspective from which we are viewing things. In other words, the particular place we occupy in the world. And we occupy a particular place in any number of regards. Culturally, in terms of uh, history, being in the early 21st century, you see the truth of our being, or the truth in general, for that matter, appears to us in a different way, depending upon whether you're seeing it from the point of view of being in the 21st century or whether you're seeing it from the point of view of, let's say, um, the early Enlightenment period or uh, from the point of view of uh, classical Roman antiquity. Like Different truths will appear to you depending upon your perspective. So one way of saying this is that the truth of our lives is irreducibly perspectival. Okay, and that may sound like a fancy word. It's not that hard. It just means it's a function of your particular perspective on things. So the way I said it in your notes is it's always articulated from a specific contextual point of view, a particular point of view in being in the world at a certain point in time. So in essence, what we are is we are uh, particular points of view on a commonly shared world. All right, so those are both true at the same time. So it's not just a matter of your... Uh, having a particular singular perspective that no one else can relate to. Why? Because yes, you have your own point of view, but it's on a commonly shared world. Those are both operative simultaneously, and, and they're both a function of your being in the world. Okay, so the truth of things is perspective. Okay, let's give you a sort of example, because maybe for some of you this might be a little bit of a slippery point. Um, as you're watching this, and you're watching me, and I'm going to sort of uh, move a little bit in my chair right now. <laughs> this is going to be part of the example. It may seem to you that aside from shifting back and forth in my chair, I'm more or less stationary. Okay, so a little bit of movement in the chair. Not very fast at all. I'm just kind of sitting here, you know, and I could get up and walk around or whatever. Or, um, but I'm more or less stationary, right? Isn't that the truth of this moment? Okay. Well, actually, when you think about it, I'm not actually stationary because I'm here in Carrollton, Georgia. Carrollton, Georgia is 33.58 degrees north latitude on planet Earth, which means that it is moving, this point in which I'm sitting, is moving around the axis of the Earth at 863 miles per hour. 863 miles per hour. By the way, maybe I'll put a little slide here at this point in the video to show you how to calculate that for your own uh, latitude because, I don't know, maybe some of you like mathematics and it's, it's kind of a sort of cutesy trigonometry problem in essence. Anyhow, so I'm moving at 863 miles per hour. Ah, well, my goodness, that's faster than the speed of sound. The speed of sound is about 750 more or less miles per hour. Actually... <laughs> the fact that I'm moving at 863 miles per hour is also a matter of perspective because from another perspective, that of the Earth actually orbiting the Sun, I'm moving at a velocity of, well, it varies a little bit. Why? Because the orbit of the Earth is actually elliptical to an extent. It's not exactly circular, and at different points along the ellipse, the velocity varies. But a good estimate, <laughs> average estimate, would be 67,000 miles an hour, which is approximately 87 times the speed of sound. Wow, seems like I'm just sitting here. Yes, <laughs> the truth of that varies depending upon your perspective, depending upon how you're sort of seeing things, depending upon your frame of reference. So if you're viewing me from the frame of reference of sort of normal reality, the way we normally construe it socially, yeah, I'm just sitting here. I'm not moving at all. If you, look, if you expand your view out a little bit, you get the idea that I'm moving faster than the speed of sound at 863 miles an hour. If you expand your view out a little bit more, Looks like I'm moving at 87 times the speed of sound at 67,000 miles an hour. If you expand your view a little bit more, 
Well, a little bit more. The solar system is actually orbiting around uh, the center of the Milky Way galaxy at a velocity of, wait for it, 470,000 miles per hour. 400, so that's almost half a million miles an hour. Wow, <laughs> going pretty fast for someone you thought was just sitting here. But the point is that the truth even of something as crude and physical as whether I'm moving and with what velocity is a function of your perspective. It's a function of how you're seeing things. And if that's true at that crude physical level, imagine how much more true it is when you're dealing with uh, the complexities and subtleties of the human psyche and our ongoing construal of meaning and our way of trying to sort of fathom the depth of our existence. Perspective is shot through and through. It's hard to escape it. All right. Hence, uh, the truth of our lives is always open-ended, depending upon our perspective. You can always shift your perspective. I think you're free enough to shift your perspective. Okay, this is a possible revolutionary moment for you. Like you're free enough to change your mind about how you're seeing the world, how you're seeing yourself. Okay, you might be that free. Okay, just a thought. Just play with it. Like, see where it leads you. Like, are you really free or not? I don't know. Maybe you're a slave. Maybe you're not, actually. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, the truth of our lives is always open-ended, subject to reinterpretation and revision as you change your perspective. Okay, not least because articulating a truth is itself an act of being in the world, which means that that act itself can't help but shift the perspective from which you seeing that truth in the first place. This is a little bit like the, that sort of interrelationship we were describing between the phenomenal layer of meaning and the phenomenological layer of meaning. Hopefully it's reminding you of that. If not, you might take a second to make that connection. Hence, the truth of existence is infinite without a distinct end or a telos. Okay, a telos, you ought to get used to this Greek word. In fact, I even wrote it in Greek in your notes. Um, I studied Greek when I was young, younger. Just a, <laughs> my tremendously misspent youth spent studying ancient languages, among other things. Okay, so um, a telos is a goal, aim, destination. The reason why I say you should learn this Greek word is because it appears with some frequency, usually transliterated, by the way, in texts of this kind, existential texts, or even philosophy texts more generally, I would say. Okay, so the truth of existence is going to be irreducibly perspectival <laughs> for the reasons we just got done. Uh, consequently, it calls for a kind of interpretation relative to your perspective and hopefully a way also a way of acknowledging your perspective. And here I'm going to flash you back to uh, what was it? One, uh, I think it was two videos ago where I was talking about, uh, you know, recognizing the four structures of your hermeneutic way of interpreting things. OK, so same idea. All right. Different language. So this is one of the points where hopefully uh, you are more remembering things than learning them for the first time. So um, hermeneutics, the truth, the truth of our lives, the truth of existence is a matter of interpreting from the point of view of our perspectives on things. Now here comes something new. One example of doing this comes to us once again by way of uh, the philosopher Martin Heidegger, whom you'll be hearing a lot about later in the semester, but for now you're just getting used to things. Uh, so one version of this has to do with his idea of aletheia. Okay, so aletheia is a classical Greek word also. Uh, in fact, once again, I wrote it for you in Greek in addition to the transliterated English. And aletheia, and I'm starting to sort of break the word into two because really it's a composite of two Greek words, basically means to uncover, uncover. So alpha in Greek is a grammatical privative which negates what follows it. And aletheia means like the covering over as in a veil. Okay, I'm sort of literally translating the Greek for you. Okay, so um, a kind of uncovering or unconcealment <laughs> is Heidegger's pretty awkward coinage, at least in translation, revealing, discovering, discovering, okay, aletheia. All right, so uncovering, that sort of thing. And uh, the idea of aletheia is that what aletheia is about is it's an ongoing dynamic process between revealing and concealing. Okay, so the covering and the discovering are always intimately and mutually and reciprocally related to one another. So the, the deep truth of our existence is about uh, uncovering and covering. Okay, and 
and sort of like this is a dramatic moment or I don't know if you can appreciate that yet but it is a dramatic moment because this is a, a an idea about how truth works it's way more fundamental and radical than our typical way our typical way of thinking about the truth goes something like this well you know if what you say matches reality then we'll regard it as true okay <laughs> this is known as the adequation theory of truth by the way and it comes to us by way of min uh, medieval scholasticism okay so the philosophy of the medieval period so this is a much more fundamental see things you can never ask the question whether what you say corresponds to reality unless there's already been a dynamic of uncovering and covering okay it's only on that basis that you can ask the more derivative question of whether propositions correspond to reality or not okay so <laughs> The sort of uh, surprising thing at this point, which we'll go into a lot more detail about later in the semester, is one of the functions of truth is to conceal things. And it's like, wait a minute, did you just like make an error in that sentence? No. One of the functions of, con of the truth is, one of the things it does is the truth conceals things. Okay, so think about the news this way. Okay, bring it down to earth, man. If, you need, if this sounds abstract, bring it down to earth. Have you ever sort of noticed, like, uh, truth as it appears to you? The news is supposed to be about the truth. Well, people of my generation used to think that, okay? This is a little dinosaur moment right now, okay? So a little boomer moment. Okay, boomer. Uh, we used to think that the people on the news were telling us the truth. Oh, I know, right? It's like sort of crazy. <laughs> we used to think that. Okay, so I think you guys, like you, you Gen Zers and Millennials and people like that, like you guys have tuned in way earlier in life uh, to the reality that the truth as it's, it's uh, pervade to you <laughs> by way of the news is also part of its function is to draw your attention away from perceiving certain kinds of things. That the news, the truth of the news, also conceals things. When you focus on one thing, you're not focusing on something else, all right? And the news operates that way, and I think to a fair extent uh, manipulates us that way. Not to get you too paranoid or anything, but I think it's, it's healthy. It's actually a salutary thing to watch the news with this in mind. Like, uh, whenever you're watching the news, I think it's a good thing to sort of wonder about what they're trying to get you not to see. Okay, <laughs> you know what they're trying to distract you away from. You know, it's a little uh, hermeneutica suspicion, I suppose. All right, so another idea. This one you've heard uh, quite a bit about. Um, I guess what was it? One, two, three, four videos ago. All right. So when we were talking about uh, this business of objective and subjective truth that comes to us by way of. Kierkegaard, okay, so the Heideggerian Aletheia, that's one sort of vision of how existential truth works. Another vision, okay, uh, comes to us by way of Kierkegaard that, you know, there's objective truths in the world and there are truths that are much more subjective that you have to experience as an individual for them to count as a truth at all. Okay, so I'm going to go through that one relatively quickly because you've already heard about it. So I gave you a couple of examples. Uh, some of them I've already mentioned, like the truth of Christian faith for Kierkegaard. Because uh, Kierkegaard is such a radical, ardent uh, Christian, the truth of Christian faith, or religious faith more generally, is a kind of subjective truth. In other words, unless you have some kind of experience of it, like there's no amount of objective evidence or logical argumentation will <laughs> that will convince you that it matters at all. Uh, the truth of dread, okay, so Remember what we said about dread. Well, dread is a sympathetic antipathy and an antipathetic sympathy, right? Isn't that what we said about dread? Yes. God, you have an incredibly retentive memory. I got to tell you that. Wonderful. And now I gave you another one, which is maybe a little bit more creepy even than dread, which is already creepy enough. The truth of your mortality, okay, as a subjective truth. You ever sort of wonder about this question? Like, how do you really know you're going to die? And, uh, you know, there's sort of an objective answer to that. And it's in the form of a syllogism. In fact, it's usually the example that they give you when they define the word syllogism in high school, probably somewhere. And it goes something like this. Well, all human beings are mortal. I myself am a human being. Therefore, I am mortal. Therefore, I am going to die. Okay. So notice that that is a combination of empirical observation, noticing that human beings die, noticing that I myself am a human being, and then a logical inference. Therefore, 
I too must die. All right, so all of that is the objective truth of your mortality, but what about the subjective truth of your mortality? And you may think at first, well, I haven't died yet, so I haven't had the experience yet. Yeah, but I bet you've had intimations of it somewhere along the way. Like somehow life has shown you or told you that you were born to this mortal coil, as Shakespeare put it, right? And so to let you feel some cold impress of your mortality on your soul every now and then, you know, like have you almost died in your life? And I bet a lot of you have. I know I came from a more physically dangerous era and so I, I the, the, if you're 20, by, the, by that point I had accumulated probably three or four experiences where I almost died, but uh, I bet a lot of you have even though uh, I think you live in a physically safer era. Like we, we were dumb. We were dumb. We boomers were dumb. Like we'd ride around without helmets and <laughs> <laughs> on our bicycles and do all kinds of crazy idiotic things, but I bet you have. So the question is like, what is life really telling you when you almost die? You know, how is it speaking to you? If you let it speak to you, you can ignore it for sure. But if you let it speak to you, if you let it inform you at that existential level, what are those kinds of experiences really telling you about your very fragile and transient time in this world, right? Because they might be speaking to you in the language of the soul, you know? And the trick is to open your ears and open your mind wide enough to hear that language, that subtle language whispered in the wind. Okay, so uh, last idea is also probably a new one for you. And we're definitely gonna talk about this later in the semester too, but for now, just sort of get the basic gist of it. It turns out that actually non-being or nothingness is actually integral to the constitution of our being. So non-being, what you are not, and what you are, are always mutually, again, reciprocally defining and influencing one another. Okay, so, you know, just think about your identity. Like part of what makes you think you're the person you are is the kind of contrast effects that occur when you think about what you do not think you are, all right? So in a way, what you do not think you are defines what you think you are, okay? <laughs> you know, so you, you, you think like, um, okay, so in front of me is like a game uh, PlayStation, and so I'm not the PlayStation, all right? I'm not uh, my, the gaming TV that's like sort of in front of me too, that sort of a gamer, all right? So I'm not that, right? I use that, you know, I have fun with it, but I'm not that, right? And, and the trick is like, oh, in other words, like uh, seeing things that you supposedly are not in a weird way sort of implicitly defines what you think you are. Yeah, okay, so same kind of idea here. So non-being and nothingness is actually integral to the constitution of being. Okay, so let's see what I wrote in your notes about this. Non-being or nothingness is integral to the constitution of being. Boom. Especially insofar as the boundary lines that define our being in its particularity are where what we are comes into contact with what we are not. Where our being meets the kind of non-being that implicitly defines it. And then further, confronting one's death is a way of becoming aware of the threatening quality of non-being. Okay, so part of what those weird moments I was trying to conjure for you or perhaps remind you of uh, like what life is actually telling you when you almost die or when you actually experience your mortality as a subjective truth is uh, that there's, it, it, there's a, for most of us, it's a scary thing. It's sort of an anxious, scary thing because we feel threatened. Well, what's the threat about? Well, the threat is the possibility of non-being. <laughs> you know, that your existence may at some point become impossible. Okay. All right. So, and, uh, well, okay, let me just finish the little bit of the notes. And that experience can serve to pull us out of our state of simple conformity. Okay. So, you know, what, in other words, what's, a, what's, what's the kind of experience that is strong enough and powerful enough to pull you out of living like a damn robot? and just conforming to what everyone else does and obeying orders when you're given orders and more or less acting like a damn puppet in your life. Well, there are very few experiences, I think, 
and that existentialists think are strong enough to pull us out of that. But one of them might be realizing your mortality, realizing how impermanent you really are, you know, how the only moment that's really guaranteed to you is this moment right now. When you think about it, oh, that's not a polite thought, is it? No, it's not a polite thought. It's definitely an impolite thought for sure. But it's a real thought. The only moment guaranteed to you and to me too is this moment right now. Okay, so in the next video we'll take up your new reading assignment after this one and a material that's going to have to do with existential psychotherapy specifically. But until then, have a good one. Take care of yourself, all right? Bye-bye.